2,000 years ago, members of the tribes of Konka and Gamet, who lived in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, made their way to the Indian subcontinent and they settled down in the Sayatri mountain range, which is in the southwest of India. They flourished and so did the language that they spoke. And that's how, my dear friends, Konkani arrived in India. Before we go any forward, I have to mention that the Konkani language for the better part of its history has had to endure a chicken and egg kind of situation because people think that, oh, Konkani is just a dialect of Marathi. And some people think Marathi came from Konkani. What really happened? <laughs> well, in this video, I'm going to help you demystify this question and also we're going to go through the entire journey of the Konkani language goes on to say that the regions that they lived in came to be known as the Konkan region and this area came under the rules of all the ancient Indian dynasties starting from or rather including the Konkan Maurya, the Satavaras, the Vijayanagara Empire, the Tughlaqs Khalji and also the Sultans of Bijapur. All these conquests had a direct impact on the language. For instance, Adil Shah Bahmari, the Sultan of Bijapur, was of Iranian origin and in his army, he had members who were from North Africa, Levant and were also Jews. So obviously, the way they spoke Konkani was going to be different. Likewise, when the Portuguese arrived, a lot of Portuguese words found their way into the Konkani language. Not only that, the Christians started using the Roman script to write Konkani, whereas the Hindus continued to use the Devanagari script. All this was fine, so long as Konkani was allowed to be spoken and used under Portuguese rule. But the moment the Viceroy forbade the use of the language, another change happened. Firstly, there was mass migration of Konkani speakers to other parts outside of Konkan. Some went closer to Maharashtra, where others went further south towards Karnataka and Kerala. As a result, words from these languages also made their way into the Konkani language and not only that, people started using the Kannada or the Persian Arabic script to start writing the Konkani language. With so many of these languages coming together and influencing Konkani and also the nature and origin of the speakers of this language, it is quite easy to understand that the way some of the words were written and spoken got distorted and with that the meaning also got distorted. However, it is to the credit of the language and its speakers and the ones promoting to conserve and preserve it that the language still continued to survive. Well, in 1939, their efforts bore fruit and uh, all the Konkani speakers living outside of the Konkani region, they got together at Karwar, Karnataka and held the first ever All India Konkani Conference and they made an appeal to the British government of India to start using Konkani as a medium of instruction in schools and textbooks be published in the Konkani language because you see regions outside of Portuguese influence they still had an option to appeal for the usage of this language and so they went ahead and but it would still take another 50 years and the liberation of Goa for anything significant to happen to give Konkani a good status. In February 1987 through the Official Languages Act Konkani was announced as the state language of Goa along with Marathi. Unfortunate that it had to share credit with the Marathi language, but some recognition at last was good. And five years later, in 1992, it was included in the eighth schedule of the Indian constitution and thus became recognized as one of the national languages of India. Talking about the Konkani literature, the earliest that we know is the work of Sant Namdeo in the 14th century and thereafter actually the literary scene becomes or tends to become zero because the Portuguese had arrived and they sort of suppressed it. Initially of course they were quite excited to learn this language and that's perfectly understandable because they had proselytizing activities on hand to finish so they produced grammar books bilingual dictionaries and documentaries that spoke about the culture and beliefs and lifestyle of the Konkani people. So all of this was good. But once they laid a solid foundation for themselves, 
they started suppressing the Kunkani language and culture. And it was pretty systematic. In 1684, the Viceroy forbade the use of the language. And thereafter, uh, there was a lot of pressure on the masses. So it began with the Christians. They said, they're like, now you're Christians. That means you identify more with the Portuguese. And so if you want to remain with us, if you want to have jobs, if you want to have uh, employment, if you want to receive help from the government, if you want to get health care, if you want to even marry, then you have to speak Portuguese and behave like a Portuguese. And of course, the other was to put a lot of pressure to give up their uh, local beliefs and customs and religion and uh, adopt Christianity. So this was pretty systematic and uh, by the early 19th century they were pretty much successful um, except for the people who mass migrated, everyone else left behind in Portuguese Konkan region was not using the Konkani language. So the question of any Konkani literature emerging from this area was not to be expected. It was a bit null. And thus, lingua canarin as Portuguese called the Konkani language, was reduced to the status of lingua de criados, the language of these servants. Pretty unfortunate. Uh, yet, uh, from here and there sporadically, uh, occasional Konkani uh, poems, stories and folk forms would come out and uh, they would be practiced elsewhere and somehow people would get a hang of it and keep tabs on it. But all of this was lost during the liberation of Goa because you see during the raids, the radio station was bombed and all the records that held these folk uh, information, um, be it song, dance, storytelling, whatever, theater, etc. Uh, all this was lost and whatever was surviving, we no longer have the equipment to Play them. The amazing kind of fight that this language has put up in face of all the adversities thrown to it, the kind of resilience it has shown to survive actually makes you want to give this language a warm hug and say, buddy, you've done so well. I'm proud of you. I'm sure you'd do that if Gungani language was actually a place. Nevertheless, when it comes to folk tales, we have some relief. Um, a scholar by the name Olivio Gomes, who was actually a, a civil servant working in the Indian Revenue Service. Uh, later on, he resigned and became an academic person. Um, uh, he produced a lot of translations of the Konkani folk tales. And for his efforts, the Sahitya Academy awarded the translation prize to him in 1993. And his uh, translations of stories, they have been compiled together and they are available as this book uh, brought out by the National Book Trust. However, the folk tale that I have chosen for you, for Kalpataru, is not one which is translated by Olivio Gomes, but from another well-wisher of the Konkani language, uh, De Penha. Um, I wasn't able to find out too much about who this person is, but uh, the fact that he worked so hard to translate Konkani folk tales means that somewhere obviously he did love this language and was at heart a folklorist and uh, he published all of these in the Indian Antiquary. I think by now you're pretty much familiar with the name of this journal and the role that this journal played in uh, in, in, in making popular, popular the Indian customs, beliefs and uh, rituals to the British public, especially those in the British administration. Now the folk tale that I've chosen for Galpataru is from a very specific place of the Konkan region. In fact, it's from an island. So we are, we are already familiar with the seven islands that make a Bombay, but apart from that, there are three to four other islands as well. And our story comes from one of those islands. It's always very interesting to know the story behind the story, and that's why I would like to spend some time sharing it with you. So, here we go. <laughs> in the year 1138, along with King Pratap Bim, a set of people came down and settled in one of those islands in the Konkan region. And they were into every kind of occupation, fishing, farming, toddy tapping. And when Saint Bartholomew, the disciple of Jesus Christ came, they converted to Christianity, thus becoming one of the first Christians of the region. And after their king, 
they underwent the conquests of all the other dynasties just like their counterparts in the other parts of the Gokan region and in their case though after Adil Shah Bahmani they had to experience the rule of the Sultans of Gujarat and then during the time of the Sultan of Gujarat the Portuguese had arrived on sea and on 23rd October 1534 on board of the ship San Mateos they had a discussion with the Sultan of Gujarat, the Shamshuddin Muzaffar dynasty. They had a discussion wherein they wanted control of this particular island. Now it is a bit noteworthy to know that this island by now was consisting of 66 villages. And 66 in Konkani is Shashti and in Maharashtrian language it is called the Saha Shashta. So the Portuguese were eyeing the Saha Shashta island and after discussions finally after about a year on the 25th of October 1535 Portuguese became the owners of the Saha Shashta island along with the islands of Bombay but we're focusing on Saha Shashta. But Saha Shashta was a very difficult name for them to pronounce and they took the meaning of the word and substituted it with their own Portuguese word which is Salsate. So our story is from the Salsate Island. Now the history of Salsate gets a little bit more interesting after this because we are a little bit more familiar with what happens next. <laughs> so yeah, we all know what happened to the islands of Bombay. They were given away as a part of dowry to Catherine de Bregrenza when she got married to Charles II of England. Uh, Salsate was not part of that island. It remained with the Portuguese. But it came to the notice of the East India Company. And surprise, surprise, it was also on the radar of the Marathas. So the Portuguese and Marathas were fighting a war over controlling Salsate and this appeared like a very good opportunity for the East India Company to barge in and at a time when Salsate was momentarily under Maratha control due to the infighting between the Marathas the East India Company was able to wrestle away this island and bring it under their control and thus control passed over to the East India Company. But what they inherited was a big mess you know all that fighting between Portuguese and Marathas meant all the architecture and all the other development that had happened on Salsate was pulled down and the place was in ruins but still amidst all that wreckage it was very easy even for a simple traveler to notice that once upon a time it was a very beautiful place with lots of beautiful manors parks churches and it was indeed a very flourishing island. So the British were now set with the task of revitalizing the place. And for this, they started inviting people from other communities to come and settle and start trade and commerce here. And one of the first persons that they invited, the governor of Bombay invited, was Kasabji Rustamji, a Pasi gentleman. And he brought in with him members of this community. And they were followed by members of other communities as well. Today we know Salsate as Greater Bombay, that's the administrative name as of today. And for someone like you and me, if you're traveling to Bombay and you are you are guessing that am I in Salsate? Could I be in Salsate or could I go to Salsate? Then the very simple thing to do is go and show up at Mira Bayandar. So Mira Bayandar is actually built on the Salsate Island, which is joined of course with the existing Bombay city uh, which was built by land reclamation really very really interesting how history changes geography and both in turn change language and culture <laughs> so now it's time to reveal the title of this week's folk tale it's how to live on half a pies now i know it sounds a little bit preachy it almost sounds like as if it's uh, a story which is going to give away tips on how to live now, something like a motivational story but trust me it's much more than that it is a humorous tale but with a very sharp and strong message on human behavior like all other folk tales of course 
So I had great fun developing the story and the characters and I can't really wait to make it live for you. So while I go and get the story up for you, you go ahead, take care and click on that subscribe button and bell notification so that when the story comes live, you don't miss it. I'll see you soon with another story from another region of India. Till then, take care. Jai Hind. Vande Matram.